Hi, welcome to Weft Tech Live. I'm Heidi Bragg, and I actually asked for this interview. I want you to know, Travis, because I was really interested in the topic at hand. I'm here today with Travis Newman. Travis is a PhD candidate at University of Nevada, Reno, mm -hmm. and he is a member of the Paiute and Shoshone Nations, as well as, and I had him write it down, so I got it right, the Reno, he's associated with the Reno Sparks Indian Colony and the Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe. Mm -hmm. All in Nevada. Yep. All in Thank Nevada. you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. And we were talking a little bit ahead of time about this topic broadly and then kind of got into a little bit of depth on a couple of things. So later today, you're doing a session on a panel about how traditional indigenous environmental practices mm -hmm. can and should affect what goes on now. Is that correct? More specifically with what's going on in the Colorado River Basin with water rights, they're, they're having me go over some of the legal precedent and how some of the spiritual stories have led to interactions with colonizers coming here and the treaties and then why certain relationships happened and then how that has gotten us to where we are in the Colorado River Basin specifically. So that's, that's kind of the angle they wanted me to talk about. Okay, and then that relates to the conversation we were having mm -hmm. earlier. Can you explain a little bit about how those treaties should have worked, how they did work, and how that's affected the way we're managing resources today? Well, if you go around the country, most tribes have stories about how the rest of the world would come here and that it would be white people that brought the rest of the world with them because they're the people of fire. And the people of fire would move upon the earth and bring the nations of air and water with them, the black and the Asians. And at that time, we were supposed to complete the spiritual circle of humanity. But because we didn't, um, think of it as things are still going along, but it's a wagon wheel missing a couple spokes. And that we had until about the times that all nations walked from east to west and then be, if we did not become brothers and sisters by that time, then things would start speeding up. And then that's where some of the climate change stuff comes into our spiritual stories. So if you look at the treaties, every single treaty we sign from Red Jacket on the east to Chief Seattle in the west talks about how we need to become brothers and sisters, truly. And we need to learn how to walk upon the earth properly. Every single one, from different perspectives, because all the tribal nations are different but they all say the same thing from looking through a different lens. Every single one of them, because of those stories. So that set up the legal precedent of where we are and even like the checks and balances system within the um, United States government. It's just they took out some of the indigenous relationships that created balance and, <laughs> and actually made it work, like the women being the original checks and balance over the president. I smiled really big when he said that one the first time. <laughs> You know, because the, the earth is female. Who better to understand another female than a female? It's all things that come from the earth. It was the female's responsibility. And there's a different connection to sustainability for women. So if men get too like, what's up? Then women are like, no, 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 no. So that was the original checks and balance that the founding fathers took out. And it happened because, you know, all the colonists were arguing with each other and the Indians stood up and said, you need to honor the principles of the great law of peace. And Benjamin Franklin was writing it down. So like, there's many ways that our spiritual stories have like gone into legal precedence for the entire nation. Okay, so given that we're out of balance now, mm -hmm. and I think pretty much everybody, whether from a spiritual and or climate and or scientific perspective can agree with that. Yeah. How, do we, how do we take the principles of indigenous environmental practice to help lay them over what we're doing now and bring us yeah. back maybe into more balance? So there's a couple things. So from our perspective, you've got to think that we have the technology to solve the problems we got. The problem is kind of like the whole toilet to tap thing. We're fighting perception and our ability to work together, not necessarily our ability to apply technology. OK, so that, that, that's one of the main principles that we're fighting. We're fighting ourselves. We're fighting our ability to become brothers and sisters. So that's like one of the main barriers from our perspective. And then the whole seventh generation prophecy, like nobody came to this country because it was all hunky-dory at home. They came because they were persecuted religions and peoples who were looking for a better life. 
And we're taught that how spiritual realities manifest into physical realities is that how you control your thoughts, your prayers, your meditations manifest into physical realities. So our native languages literally don't have bad words. And that you have to think seven generations forward and backward in everything that you think and do. So it reverberates that far back. And this is the, is it the environment or is it your genetics debate? Because in our way, if you're thinking good things, you're at, if you're looking deeply within yourself and you're healing and you want healing, you can literally change your environment, which changes your DNA. So you're, ch you're healing seven generations back. And one of the big problems why we're not coming together is because we're not truthfully looking inside ourselves and how we're carrying those traumas and how that disconnection from ourselves is leading to this out of balance way of thought, which is creating problems, which is disconnecting us from ourselves and our ability to work together to solve our problems. It's funny that everything just comes back to people, right? Yeah. And how they relate. <laughs> so are there, um, do you have any specific, like say anecdotes or personal experiences about how we can bridge that gap between indigenous environmental practices and contemporary approaches to sustainability? Well, there's a couple things actually. So like everything we know about activated carbon stems from indigenous burning practices, okay? You can control the dose, it is medicine. So you have to control the dose of fire. Um, and then you can control the chemical properties of what's left over in the ashes and things like that. And that's how we um, manipulated the environment. It's relationship and respect, all right? So it's a respect of how the actual feedback loops work spiritually and physically. So, in, so this is kind of what I'm talking about. So everyone thought this was nature when they got here coming from other places, but it wasn't nature. It was, an in, it was a highly engineered garden that was so good, people thought it was nature. All right, so when I'm, well, this is what I'm kind of talking about. Indigenous burning practices, you're trying to burn off and you're trying to create the proper root structure, which pulls up the water, which then you can control which plants grow there, which you, then you can control the animal movements that come in and you can create entire landscapes that control your food. So, so in that way, you're controlling entire ecosystems and you're engineering it, but you have to think about the animal interactions. You have to think about the root structures. You have to think about the water. So it's not just treatment trains. You're thinking about the entire connection to the entire system up, down, and around. And then how you have to come in with respect and you have to tell the system, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. Because like, sometimes you have to burn and kill plants to create the ecosystem that you're trying to create. But the way this is, you know, there's a lot of feedback loops and how this system works. So that's why you, you, you come in with respect. You tell it what you're doing. After this, I'd love to talk to you more about this. Because if you've driven through the high desert in Nevada, it's interesting to me to think of that as a cultivated garden mm -hmm. and how those things were put in place to make that the way yeah. it is to bring the antelope and everything else in at the right time and at the right mm -hmm. place. And have everything grow just like it's supposed to grow. Yeah have the right filtration of the water coming down in the watersheds, putting the seeds in the right places. So it really is creating an ecosystem. And then you move around, and then, and then you're controlling your waste and your water usage. So there's, there's a bunch of things that's thought in the system that's created. And we haven't thought through that deeply as far as what I've seen in growing up here now with some of the infrastructure we have. It wasn't thought through that deeply. It's interesting as someone who grew up with a Western perspective but read the stories to realize they're not just stories, they're a handbook in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. So you've taught me that today. <laughs> Travis, I wish you great luck with your PhD. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us. And if you want to learn more, Travis, is, what time's your panel? At uh, 1.30. At 1.30, he's doing a session with more. Thanks for joining us on WEFTech Live. Again, I'm Heidi Bragg, and we'll be with you again throughout WEFTech. Thanks. <laughs>